optimizations in KVM. Um, I have a lot of slides. I'm going to try to blow through them real quick. Um, if I need to slow down, feel free to speak up. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of KVM performance optimizations that we do in the performance group at Red Hat. Um, basically, we're trying to improve the out-of-box experience so it will work better. I think we've been making good progress uh, with Doors team and the upstream community over the last year. Um, if you had, if I had given this talk a year ago, it would have been much different. Um, the main thing is now you can use libvirt wherever possible. Um, where a year ago I would have told you not to use libvirt, that, that team's done a great job and you can make lots of uh, out-of-the-box performance improvements just using libvirt. So before we dive in, um, a couple things. We had a new guy start in our group a couple months ago and we asked him to fire up a guest um, using NFS, run some tests using NFS on a 10 gig network. And he was getting about 35 megabytes per second. Um, and he's like, what's going on? I should be getting a lot better. Um, and we're like, yeah, you should. Um, but I want to use this to illustrate a couple things. Um, the original presentation I had pulled a lot of this from was actually open office, so when I'd click through, things would pop up. Now they sort of all show up. Um, I'll use a green arrow because with the performance, sometimes we use time, and with time you want lower is better. So I'll try to use a green arrow everywhere to show which is better, um, so I don't have to keep saying it. And I'll add other, other things as we go. Um, quick agenda, I'll let you read it. You can read it quicker than I can. So this list the performance improvements that the community has made over the last year or so. Again, I'll, I'll let you guys read it, and we'll try to touch on most of these as we go. So hopefully you've not forgotten this already. Um, this was specified, be, this problem was caused because he didn't specify the OS at creation time. Uh, with Vert Manager, again a plug for libvert if you will, um, if you specify the details, you will get, um, come in, you know, we say use Red Hat 6, because um, that's what we do. Um, and that's gonna give you vhostnet. So he gets 12 and a half times percent improvement he goes from 35 up to 400 and something um, when he gets vhostnet, and that was caused purely because he didn't specify what type of network driver to use. So we got the RTL driver. Um, with the vert IO, you're, you're still much better, down just under 400. So a lot of this is, you know, being as specific as you can. Um, Next, we'll jump to memory tuning a little bit. Um, not so much tuning, but using huge pages. Um, this slide's actually a little out of date. We do a lot of one gig testing now, too, where we have one gig huge pages. Um, initially, we didn't have machines with enough memory to make it useful to, to do one gig testing. When you only have 24 gig, it tends to not help too much because you can't create big guess. Um, transparent huge pages work great now. And the other thing is, we'll have some data here that will show you use it not only on the host, but in the guest. Yeah? On the previous slide, should the, the memory pages be similar to what your average VM is on the system? Or is that not related? So if you have four virtual machines with two gigs each, should you use two gig pages? Um, well, I think right now you can use either two meg pages or one gig pages. You can, I don't know that you can specify a different number. And if Rick's still here, he'll, he'll correct me, I'm sure. Right? It's either... It's, it's the hardware limitation, it's And with one gigabyte page, it doesn't need to be pre-allocated at boot. It's exactly what you want to remember. While the two megabyte pages, um, they can even be swapped out broken up and spoke out. You don't need to know what you're going to throw at the system beforehand. The kernel will figure it out and give you the best it can with whatever resources you have and the workload you throw at. So this shows the result. Um, we have a pretty big guest that's on a 24 core um, Westmere. We, we created a 24 vCPU guest, gave a 24 gig of memory. We were in spec JBB. You can see in the guest you actually get a 30% improvement by using large, uh, huge pages everywhere, where on bare metal you only got a 25% improvement. So in theory, you're, you come out a little bit ahead over bare metal, uh, if you want to twist it that way like a performance guy might. 
point at this, right? Not the slides. Um, so we'll jump quickly into network. Um, I, I like to do the network because that's the other side of my work at Red Hat is I do a lot of network performance work. Uh, one thing people don't realize is use, if you're using lots of things, you know, going to back up somewhere and, and other networks, use multiple networks. Um, reduce the traffic to a bridge. One thing with Linux is a problem called ARP Flux that lots of people run into um, from the customer cases we get. Basically, Linux, you can give it an IP address, but it's going to look up the Mac and say, oh, I know this machine, and I can get to it through this interface. I can get to it through your 1 gig interface instead of your 10 gig interface, and it will push traffic that way. Uh, if you go and set ARP filter, you won't run into that problem for the most part. Um, if you are doing backups or something, you can kick up your MTUs. You can do that. Um, with the newer kernels, it works all the way through now. Back in the early days, it, you had to set it everywhere, but nowadays you can, you can click it through. Um, and you don't need a bridge, physical hardware to do inter-node inter stuff, and you can really kick the MTU up because you're not limited by hardware. So VertIO, are most people familiar with the VertIO architecture or just the people I work with all the time? So basically, the default VertIO, um, there's a quick drawing of it. So you're going through QEMU to go into the guest. Um, so the problem is you get a context switch every time you do that. And it hurts throughput a little bit, but it really shows up with latency. Uh, on this graph, it's time, so lower is better. The dark blue line is the host, and the yellow line is VertIO. Um, different message sizes on the bottom, and you can see there's a 4x gap, it, just in latency for what you're trying to do. Uh, and we'll come back to this a couple of times through this. Is that guest to guest or host to host? Or? That was external to guest. So you, you have to go through, you have to do that switch. Um, so vhostnet came in. Basically, you can see you move QMU off to the side, you're going right in. A um, couple other talks, they were talking about using the vhost already, so we won't get into that a lot. But you can see without that extra copy, the latency is way down. Uh, still not as good as we'd like. This graph, uh, take a second to explain it. Basically, each two sets of bars is one data set, um, and it's vertio versus vhostnet. And the stacks are different operating system times, so you can see basically what I'm trying to show is the vhostnet uses no user time, which is the red or the top one for those that can't see red. What's the benchmark? This was just uh, TCP stream, NetPerf. No. So, and measured CPU time. Um, and this is all 10 gig network. So, you can see that in general, vhost is a little lower anyways, but the user time where you're doing that extra copy, you know, it shows where that extra copy is killing you, basically. Um, another way to look at it is I said, okay, megabits per second over CPU time or CPU, you know, cycles. So the red line would be vhostnet, so you're more efficient, essentially. Am I going too fast or? So next we'll get into device assignment and SRIOV. Um, we've touched on that a couple other talks already. And this time I presented a little different. You can see just side by side with SRIOV. Um, you have the virtual devices. Um, we get into the, the talks here. There's a lot of similarities between the two, but basically SRIOV allows you to use the device across the host where direct device assignment will only let you use it for that guest. You can't use it anywhere else. Um, and this is the, the verbiage for SRIOV. Um, technically, you know, we say you can't live migrate it, but if you really know what you're doing and Chris helps, you can. Or, so we're back to uh, one last time for this graph. You can see the latency with SRIOV is much lower um, still than even the vhost net. You're getting close to bare metal. And what tweakings did you do in the, in the guest? Vhost um, with SRIOV the standard, default, standard default. default. I haven't done pinning. Any of the I did some. I did consistent pinning throughout um, because, as you'll hear over the next 
Yeah, CPU pin just so everything, everything moves, doesn't move on you, because uh, once it moves, you're screwed. And we'll get into that in a little bit to, to some degree. But basically, it's a 16-core machine and four vCPU guests, so if you let it move, then... 10G network. 10G network. BX. Yeah, this was probably the Intel card, the Niantic. Yeah. So um, basically, the other, the other advantage of device assignment or SRV is you use the native driver in the guest. Um, with SRV, a lot of the companies now are coming out with virtual specific function devices and drivers. Yeah. Was the kernel preempted or voluntary preemption? Excuse me? Was the kernel built for preemption or voluntary preemption or what kind of? It was a st Standard RHEL 6. stock RHEL 6 kernel, yeah. Sorry. Question was preemption or not? So RHEL 6 hosting guests? Yes. Would have been 6. Um, this is a result company we have do, uh, we do some work with. They did a DVD store, um, used SRIOV to do NFS. Um, again, you know, here higher is better, but with bare metal they were up at 92. Um, when they used SRIOV they're at 86 without, which is VertIO net, I believe it was. Um, you know, they were, they were much lower, so you can see the improvement just using SRIOV even in that case. So let's get to I.O. Um, basically, even though you're in a guest on the host, you still want to do a lot of your basic tuning um, that you do for I.O. I'm not going to get into the details here. It's fairly standard Linux. Um, just want to make sure I mention it. Um, some tests we run, we use low-level tests to start, micro benchmarks like I.O. zone. Um, and then the I.O. elevators we found make a difference depending on your workload. Um, this lists the major differences with them, how to set them. Um, we basically have found deadline works the best for most of our test cases. But with any of this, it really depends on your, on your workload and your, and your use case. So um, I would always recommend, you know, try our suggestions, but don't come back and say, well, that didn't work, because we might say, oh, if you're doing that, yeah, it won't. That made any sense. Um, this shows I.O. elevators, um, running deadline on the host, different OLTP workload. Um, can't really say the name because it's not a qualified test result per se, but it's a typical database that you might find in an enterprise environment. Um, you can see that deadline is, is the top as you, you get higher. Um, So caching, um, brought up a little discussion on this earlier. Lots of times we recommend people go with none. Um, we're right through, it's gonna get written to the page cache, but also confirmed on the disk before it returns. Um, we typically tell people not to use write back because there's data integrity issues with it. If your host crashes, then you've lost whatever's there. Um, this result, a little bit canned, if you will, uh, we use Fusion I.O. cards, which can do high rates. Um, but it shows as you go from 10 users, oh, sorry, one guest to four guests, you get a big improvement with cache equals none. Um, we made sure that when we went to four guests, we were using all the available memory, or most of the available memory. Well, that's not really phrased right, but we made sure that things were gonna get ca flushed out of page cache quicker when you went to four. We weren't using all the available memory. Um, but basically our philosophy is give the memory to the guests, let them decide what to do, don't, don't rely on the page cache in the host for lots of VMs. If you do a single VM, it might make sense. Is there a deadline schedule right now? Yes. Um, so again, if you get into your file systems, you, know, you can go in, configure read aheads, things like that. If you have enterprise storage, um, going to talk about async I.O. a bit. Um, there's some new support in there recently. So here we use threaded versus na native, uh, where threaded is the default. This was, again, the OLTP workload. 
to a file system, but we tell, treat it like it's block I.O. Um, we use direct I.O. Not direct I.O., sorry. But we, we treat it more like a, a block than a, than a file system, and you can see that native comes out ahead. Um, again, you're, you're depending on the exact file system you're using, your results may vary. And if we think back for five minutes ago, maybe, for the network device assignment, um, we've actually been using it with block devices, too. Basically, we pass a SCSI controller, uh, HBA, into the guest, tell the guest it owns it. Um, so this is a SAS workload where it takes time to load, where um, it's time, so lower is better. You can see bare metal's closest to me. When we use pass-through, it uh, takes about, I think that's 6% longer, where if we use, you know, treat it as a regular disk, um, it's 25% longer. So a couple years ago, we also demoed at uh, the IDF with one of the vendors, SRIOV, but with their controller. Um, but they actually never published that. They, they demoed it, but never, never published it. I think it's more the uh, return on investment for, for the block people. So, so NUMA, we've, we've heard a bit about NUMA today. I um, think we'll hear more tomorrow. Um, people read that. Basically, we, we like to do it to keep the memories low, um, memory access times low, and I'll get to that in a second. One of the, the ways I find to prove to people that it, it's useful to do this is you purposely mistune it. Put, use NUMA to pin your application to CPUs on node zero and then pin the memory to something far away and, and watch how slow it goes. Um, so this is the output, of, well, chopped output of NUMA CTL dash dash hardware. It's called the slit table. Um, in the blue, you can see between nodes two and node one, your, your times. Um, basically, 10 is normalized to one. So it says anything going from node two to node one, where the 22 is, is two and a half times, takes two and a half times longer to happen for a memory access. Um, and this is an eight node system, eight, eight NUMA node. Uh, so it's a little bigger. If you're on a smaller system, it might not be as dramatic. This shows the results of uh, some multi-guest testing where we use NUMA versus not NUMA. Um, stack graph, so you can see your output, just keeping things local, getting, not getting thrashed around. Okay, processor details. This is some work that we're doing now. Um, been ongoing for a bit based on feedback from the field. Um, you can come in and specify, you know, I want an Ahalem chip or I want a Westmere chip. Um, we've seen some quirks from that with the field and we're trying to figure out where it is. Sometimes people would specify an Ahalem and the test would seem to take longer to run. Um, we think it might be tied to some of the caching model. We're digging into it now. Um, so just be careful when you specify. Experiment, see what works in your, your cases. Does that not happen with the AMD processors, or is it just specific to Intel? Um, we didn't see it as much with the AMD processors, but I think part of the modeling is anything. If you tell it in the Halem, it actually treats it as an i7, which has a much smaller cache. Um, Would you use things like um, QMU64 or something like that? Yeah, and really, I mean, we've done, I, I don't have the data with me because we don't have a complete set, but basically we did like LM Bench, and Nehalem comes out much better there than the QMU64, but there were other cases we had done with Java workloads and, and some stuff we got from customers where the QMU64 actually outperformed Nehalem. Um, so it's trying to find the right cache size test to go in and, and see, because we've hacked a version that we can go adjust the cache as we want. I would be happy to explain offline why QMU64 is not a good pick. But, uh, 
uh, yeah, we have. I mean, to the uh, official uh, virtualized CPU model, but we do not have the time to. Uh, we have a break and over that break. Over a beer. So, just one other question. So, if you leave that blank, would that um, inhale It would pretend to be an inhale uh, if you leave it blank, I believe you get the QMU64 out of Libvirt. Hello. Um, again, with Affinity, a year ago I would have told you pin wherever you can. Libvirt has just added support for true NUMA support. Um, so I think from a RHEL perspective, it's in 6.2. I believe it's already out upstream, right, Dor? Do you know? Is Dan here, or is he off? I think he's off, off on another talk. Oh, the support, yes. it's, it's upstream already, right? Yes, it, it's upstream, and it's in the new word that's uh, been um, So again, it, you, know, you get good gains with that, um, keeping things local. And then a quick list of performance monitoring tools that we use. Um, wrap up. Blown through this pretty quick, so do people have questions? Yes. Yeah. I, I would just add, I don't know if I slept there or not, but the sloppiness value by default is very high. Definitely set that as low as possible so that right. over time your system doesn't start swapping the system. Right, the, the comment was to, to set the swappy, swappiness value as low as you can um, to keep things from swapping around. And that's on the host, right? Here? Right. right, yeah. Um, that's one thing you'll see if you have a lightly loaded guest, you know, like a two vCPU guest on 16 cores. You'll see that if you're keeping the guest busy, the host is going to move it somewhere else because it thinks that CPU is busy, um, which is some things we're addressing. Here's some, some basic links. Um, you probably know them all, except maybe the virtualization, virtual, that guide. Um, I think that's it, Chris. Any questions?